Good morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters, CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning, and hello, kids, and welcome to Season 3 and Episode number 305 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryo Media Network. Whoop, 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 a little disco for you. Whoop, 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 whoop. Ah, I'm your host, the eager beaver pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver A, and... Oh, did I say the day it was? Not sure. Today, recording day is Monday, January 29th, 2024. We have, uh, do we have a nibble or a bite today, Mr. Grizzly? I'm working from home today, so we can we can hang out right. for a while. So we have if, a, if I don't fall asleep. <laughs> we have a bite. Uh, I see the kids are already liking my t-shirt. Mm. I would cuddle you so hard. <laughs> I'm feeling extra snuggly today. Um, a big thank you goes to our podcast founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Misty Mysteries from Corbin Moon Publishing and CanadianTarot.com. And for some reason, I have a flying buttress coming out of my head. Right <laughs> so I don't know. Fix that right there. There you go. Because uh, we need to be styling, of course, because the kits demand fashion. Well. And glamour. <laughs> and with me, as you can hear, is my dear friend, Mr. Grizzly. Um, Gee, it's going to be a beautiful day here at the Beaver Lodge. I am a little tired, I have to say, because it's been a very busy weekend. But before we go into anything else, let's ask our dear friend, Mr. Grizzly, how's your mental health doing today, sir? Well, sir, um, if I wake up uh, between now and noon i'll let you know <laughs> i'm out of coffee so i'm drinking chi chai which is good but it's not coffee uh I, I forgot to pick some up yesterday so yeah i'm very 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 tired and not fully awake yet so i i the jury's out on everything right now all right i am awake in that sense i'm just like body tired um i've entered the period of my life which is going to be my life for the next two months, I'm guessing, uh, where I'm either going to be very rehearsal or show heavy. Mm. So, um, so for example, uh, Saturday we had a four hour rehearsal for a musical and, sure. uh, four hour rehearsals are a little long. I usually start checking out around two hours and a half. Yeah. Um, That's and the room in which long. we're, yeah, the room in which we're rehearsing is very, very, very cold oh, great. and yeah. very 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 echoey so i've been coming back home with splitting headaches yeah. um and then um saturday night evening after four hours of rehearsal my beaver sweetie um the choir with which we sing from which i stepped back for a while is doing something called chant chantuary over the course of january where okay. every saturday night we're just we're opening it up to the community this and we're practicing different types of chant from different types of era eras are in different languages and this week we we're doing romanian chant 
So my beaver sweetie was kind of leading it in a way. Um, so of course I could not miss that, right? Could not miss that because I had to go and support him. Uh, which uh, had to is, you know, I don't mean had to as in, you know, I have to go. I mean, it's like your beaver sweetie is doing something amazing. You have to go, right? Mm -hmm. It's just what you do. It's part of being a good boyfriend. So, um, I did that and it was wonderful. And then yesterday we had a, another four hour rehearsal for the musical. And there was a production meeting for the, as you like it play that I did not get to go to. And immediately after that four hour rehearsal, I had to go to a rehearsal for as you like it, uh, which fortunately was not four hours, uh, was, was short, uh, but they were back to back. And in both of them, I'm singing. So, um, my voice <laughs> Shot after four hours of dancing and singing, and doing this. I was like, oh man. Uh, so yeah, uh, I was a little pooped. I, I, I'm feeling it because you know, I'm no longer 26. So, Get the hell out of here, really. <laughs> yeah, but uh, really happy. But uh, it seems that the next uh, four or five Sundays are going to be like this. <laughs> so I'm just like, oh. Well, <laughs> creator, give me strength. Um, but the shows are looking really good. I'm really excited. They're going to be great. They're really going to be great. Uh, so I can't wait to, can't wait till we get to show them. All right. In the news, um, I was thinking yesterday, it's like, wow, I don't really have much time this weekend to figure out what's going on in the news to prepare Monday's show. And then before going to bed, I started writing a couple of things for the blog page on Facebook. And then it turns out, oh my God, there was like a metric shit ton of news. Wouldn't know. I, I shut off everything this weekend. I uh, Saturday morning got up, had some breakfast. I did a couple of small odd jobs around the apartment and then uh, went and met Bridget and her, her daughter for lunch. And, oh, nice. Uh, Bridget and I hopped in an Uber and went to Coena, which is a spa at a hotel in Aylmer. It's only four kilometers from her place, so it's really close. So, yeah, we spent uh, spent the weekend at the spa. It was oh. kind of a surprise. Uh, she sprung on me. So, yeah, it was uh, it was a good time. And spent a, they gave us a suite uh, for a suite price. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was a good weekend. So, she because I had told her the, the previous... Monday, I said, I don't want to do anything this coming weekend. She goes, what do you mean? And I go, I haven't, I said, other than the weekend we went to the Nordic, I, I haven't had a weekend off. I've worked every single weekend, just, you know, doing production stuff and that. And, and I said, I'm just, I'm, I need a break. I need a, I need a weekend off. So she's like, okay, would you be amenable to me doing something for you? I'm like, sure. So she took me to the spa. So it was a good oh, weekend. Yeah. How wonderful. That's love. Oh yeah. yeah, I love love. Yeah, yeah. It was a uh, it was a much needed relaxing weekend. Uh, going from the the cold dip pool to the to the hot tubs to the sauna to the Himalayan salt rooms. Yeah, it was it was cool. It was really cool. Oh, cool. All right. Now, we, did, um, we did bump into two people last night who had uh, attended the. Uh, oh yes, the yes, the state funeral for uh, Mr. Ed Broadbent. Did you know it was open to the public? I did not know. Neither did I. And they told us, they said, yeah, you, it wasn't widely announced, but it was open to the public. I'm like, well, I would have went had I known. And they're like, yeah, I thought it was a closed thing. But they're like, no, no, anybody could show up. Oh, you had to well, put your name that, on a list and, and prove who you were, of course. But yeah. That changes purposes. a lot. Well, it makes sense that it would be open to the public for Ed Broadbent. He would have wanted it that way. Well, That's yes, who he yes, was. yes. Right, but you you see the reason that changes a lot. That's a bit of information I did not know, oh. is because um, there was a lot of people in attendance at that state funeral. Now, normally, a leader of an opposition party doesn't get a state funeral mm -hmm. at all. Yes, right. Uh, but Ed Broadbent was so key. Loved. Love, well, love number one, but played a key role in the development of the nation. I mean, up until yes. Jack Clayton, Ed Broadbent was the member of the NDP who had gotten the leader of the NDP, I should say, who had gotten the most seats in Parliament. And the NDP does play a very, very special and particular role. Well, I should say, did in our uh, system of government. 
uh, because it seems that uh, Jagmeet Singh is uh, moving the party far, far, far away yes. from what the NDP's role uh, was. But Ed Broadbent, um, of the leaders of the party um, that have played that role, the role that we've come to know and love and respect the party for, and you have to understand that the NDP is a party that a lot of people respected even if they wouldn't vote for them. They oh, still yeah. respected the party because everybody like, you know, the, the conscience of, an, you know, basically they often called it the Jimmy Cricket of the nation. Right, the conscience of the nation. And it's gone away from that. And yes, as Kit James does mention appropriately, Leighton got a state funeral as well. Yes. So if you have been a decent leader that has contributed significantly to the nation, you probably will get a state funeral. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. You probably will. Um, but yesterday, um, one leader was not in attendance. Yeah, I wonder who that could have been. I wonder who that could be. Um, so, the leader of the Conservative Party of Canada, Pierre Troliev, or Troliev, decided not to show up. He decided to give an address to his caucus instead that uh, a lot of media ran with and said, you know, Pierre fires up his caucus. And like the first thought in my head was, what, did he throw gasoline on him first? Um, but <laughs> yes, but he basically, if you go on YouTube and look it up, um, I haven't looked it up fully myself yet, but apparently it was described as 25 minutes of lie after lie after lie after lie after inflammatory lie on the day of the state funeral of Ed Broadbent, probably a bad day to be doing that type of thing. And it, given that it was open to the public, I'm guessing he could have chosen to be there because the rumor online is that maybe he wasn't invited, sort of like Trump was not invited to John McCain's funeral. Mm -hmm. right? But if it was open to the public, even if not invited, he could have put his name on the list and shown up. And everybody says, oh, well, you know, crashing a funeral is such a bad thing. But we are talking of the man that decided to attend a Hanukkah, first day of Hanukkah lighting ceremony to provide cover for himself for the fact that he was really participating in a $1,700 a plate fundraiser on the same damn night that he prevented every single Jewish MP in the House of Commons from spending the first night of Hanukkah with their communities or families. Well, so not it's mention, not like he'd be against crashing a funeral. Well, not not to mention the fact that we can't overlook the fact that he went to that uh, community center and took photos, uh, and it was a community center that he voted against funding for. Not that one. He voted sure. against. Yeah, he voted against funding a community center in Vancouver. He voted against funding the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Montreal. Oh, okay. Well, I guess so. This guy that's going around Canada saying how much he supports Israel and basically crapping on every single Muslim Canadian and Arab Canadian, whether mm -hmm. they're Muslim or not, in the process, it yeah. is used, literally used, the Jewish community on that night. Of course he would. As human shields. To say, well... You know, no, no, I really went for the Hanukkah ceremony, and given that I just happened to be there, I went to a fundraiser. No, no, you went to a fundraiser. You had a... And you used the ceremony so that you could have something to say to the media. Say that you were doing cover. something noble. Yeah. As if you were really doing something noble, you would have let everybody else also go to those Hanukkah ceremonies. Yeah, instead of voting no against every single item in the budget. Including, every single one. Including help to the Jewish community. Yeah. During this time. They voted no on every single thing. Every single every thing. Single thing. So this man is a hypocrite of the highest order. Yeah. Highest order. So he was in there and he delivered this speech to them instead of being uh, at the state funeral. So he did partisan stuff. Now, of course, he did partisan stuff on a day that the Prime Minister announced that on March 4th, there will be a by-election in Durham, which is the electoral district that was held by Aaron O'Toole, the leader of the Conservative Party that was defeated, that understood that you go away. Hello, Andrew's here. 
uh, after you lose. And it seems that, well, it seems that the candidate that the conservatives are running there is Jamil Giovanni. Now, if that name sounds familiar to you, it should because Jamil Giovanni was one of the members of the media that got fired from Bell Media during that time where it was firing everybody. Like, you know, oh God, her name's escaping me off the top of my head. Lisa Laflamme and everyone else. Uh, but in Jamil Giovanni's case, he was claiming that he got fired because Bell Canada ex Bell, Bell Media expected him to believe behave in a certain way and report in a certain way because he was black. Except we, uh, we and read. he didn't want to do that. We we read the uh, the complaint and uh, no no <laughs> he's full of shit. Yeah. So this guy basically he said. I believe, uh, what was it that he said here? Hold on, I have it here for some reason. Yes, he claims he was fired because Bell Media had a rigid but unspoken vision for how black people should fit into the company, that Bell wanted him to be a token beholden to the company's identity politics, that on Canada Day they asked him to talk about how Canada was a terrible racist country and he refused and blah, 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 blah. And he launched a lawsuit against them claiming that that's the reason why they fired him. Now, of course, Bell Canada, or Bell Media, I should say, says uh, the reason for which he was fired from his past job was because, A, his former employer allegedly had serious concerns regarding his failure to respect Bell's DEI principles as set out in its code of business contact and different DEI initiatives, including his open disdain for the company's effort to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion within the organization because he invited guests to his show who espoused anti-vax views and spread false information about the necessity and efficacy of COVID vaccines and alternative therapies such as hydroxychloroquine, because he demonstrated gross and intolerable insubordination and a disdainful attitude towards his manager by alleging she had leveled baseless smears against him, just like he alleged that the company... and because of declining ratings... So, two different versions. Yeah. Now, how would we maybe have something to help us decide as members of the public who might be telling the truth? Well, it seems that all the leaders have been addressing their caucus because today, Parliament resumes. Mm -hmm. So, most leaders have a little get-together with their caucus, give them a little pep talk, you know, that kind of stuff, right? So, Mr. Singh did it. Mm -hmm. Mr. Trudeau did it. Mm -hmm. Mr. Polyev did it. On the day of yes. his Broadbent's funeral. Yes. Now, when Mr. Trudeau did it, he made a comment about the by-election yeah. and said that Pierre Polyev had a twofer running in the election and that that twofer was that he had an ideologue and an insider. Member of the media, clearly an insider, Mm -hmm. And as we're going to see by what comes next, most definitely an ideologue. So the prime minister told the truth. Now, the prime minister made these comments back to back. Mm -hmm. Pierre Pelyev has got a twofer, an ideologue, and a... So Mr. Giovanni decided to take that thing twofer. I guess he's been watching a lot of 30 Rock. Apparently. Apparently. Which, is, which was, a, for people who don't know, was a TV show in the United States for a while. Um, very sort of satirical TV show about how a television network is run. And, you know, anyway. So, and on that show, there was a character named Twofer, T O O F E R, not mm -hmm. T W O F E R. And for example, one of the jokes in the show is that Alec Baldwin, the boss that was sort of, you know, a little off mm -hmm. now and then. Uh, referred to him as a twofer because he was black and Harvard educated. Yeah, okay. I get the reference. Yeah. All right. So now for most Canadians, a twofer is a case of beer. Two, four, 24 beer. Right. Or a twofer is, well, 
two I don't know if I, I, yeah like if you live in ontario there's like i don't know if it's throughout canada but there's a whole pizza chain that's like two for one yeah it's basically they actually have the numbers two for one but it's still two for right or for example if you're a pot aficionado uh two for is when uh somebody passes the detchy to the left one time oh, takes really? two toes off takes two te- hits off it instead of just one oh never heard that before you two furred Found that one in the Urban Dictionary. Hmm. Also, a twofer can mean, it can have a racist connotation if you want to, because, right, a twofer, it can refer to a person who belongs to two minority or underprivileged groups and can satisfy two quotas, which is why that joke was being used in 30 Rock, because he was mm-hmm. black mm-hmm. and Harvard educated. Right. Not black and poor or black and, mm. but in the, but now when you re- use the word two for, to refer to someone who belongs to two minority or underprivileged groups and can satisfy two quotas, that necessarily is not racist. Well, it's, it's kind of real. <laughs> I'm a two for. Yeah. I'm yeah. fabulous. And clearly. Not I all that been, white. Yeah. I've gotten a little bit of extra pigmentation. It is racist, however, if you suggest that the person has their current job mm-hmm. because they're fabulous and have a little pigmentation rather than merit. But that's not what the Prime Minister suggested. The Prime Minister said he was an ideologue. And an insider. And an insider. Mm-hmm. Nothing to do with his race. But Jamil Chavani, when he did his video, clipped the little of section course. of the prime minister saying he's a twofer and then pretended he didn't know what the prime minister must have meant by that. Of course, he could, if he just kept the video running an extra five seconds, right? But he pretends that he just heard that and stopped the video right there and says, oh my God. I mean, normally when somebody launches an insult at me like this, you know, we get to the insult, and, you know, or what I think might be an insult actually, because I don't know yet. I usually keep reading. When I know it's an insult, I stop reading. Mm-hmm. But usually if I have a doubt, you know, I was like, well, let's see what he's talking about. So he decided to put that clip in his video and then suggest somehow that the prime minister had suggested that he was racist and called the prime minister names. And of course, Pierre Pelliev really ran with that and so did all the minions. Now, if Jamil Giovanni rings a bell again to you, remember that little video we showed you a couple months ago about... Pierre Polyev showing up on the doorstep of some elderly lady with Michelle Ferreri mm. recording it like this. This is like, come on, you little lady, tell Pierre what you what you really think of the prime minister. Like this, and he sit there and like this and talked about his father and himself and says, "Well, you know, they're Marxists, right?" Yeah. You know who else was there? Jamil. Jamil Javadi. Hmm. Yeah, he was stumping for him. So you see the little video of Jamil Giovanni like getting out of the car and running behind Pierre. You know that little mm-hmm. Bugs Bunny and Roadrunner thing? Yeah, like with the, that little, little dog. dog. Yeah. This and that big dog. You know? hey, Spike. hey, Spike. Hey, Spike. Spike. Yeah, yeah, shut up. So he was doing that. And when Pierre Poliev told that lady, lied to that lady, that the Prime Minister was a Marxist, did Jalvil Giovanni say, oh my God, you're calling the Prime Minister names. That's a horrible thing. You're like... Oh, so we're supposed to believe that Jamil Giovanni has problems with people calling other people names, leaders of parties calling other people names. But we know that's not true because we have it on video now, don't we? Well, and I, I'm, I've been led to believe that apparently the woman that was being interviewed randomly knocked on her door. Apparently, apparently... Uh, she worked for Andrew Shear. Oh. In conjunction with Roman Baber. Oh. Apparently. I, I cannot confirm that, but this is what I've read. I don't know that that's true, but it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, it's kind of like, who's that other woman who, uh, uh, traveling home from Canada and refused to show her passport or something? Oh, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, uh, Joe. Joe Walsh. Yeah, yeah. Who then took another picture and said that she was arrested for posing like this. Yeah, yeah. She's, she's, I don't know if they're paying her to do that, but she does this a lot. Like a lot. I don't know that she's on the payroll 
of the Conservative Party. I don't even believe that that's the case. I just think, yeah, George Ann, George Ann Burke. Apparently, it was George Ann Burke who was the woman in that video oh. with Pierre Polyev calling him a Marxist, calling the, the PM a Marxist. And she's kind of a special piece of work, her. Uh, let's see if I can find some stuff on her. You are bringing me some knowledge. I had no idea of that. So, apparently, apparently, the prime minister is calling him names and being racist towards him. Which we know, in both cases, is not true. Mm -hmm. So, what are we now more inclined to believe? That Bell Canada, or Bell Media, I keep on saying Bell Canada, that Bell Media fired him because um, he wasn't being the stereotype of the black person that they thought he would be, or because he really did object to maintaining corporate policy on diversity, equity, and inclusion, peddled COVID misinformation, was insubordinate to his boss, and was having lower ratings. Uh, oh, the scales are tipping. The scales are tipping. The man is a liar. Now, the prime minister didn't call him names, but I will. You're a big old man, baby, and a big fat liar. Creating videos, whining, ah, Prime Minister, call me names. You're a man, baby. Yeah, I don't. I see you. I have the video here. Uh, you, you, uh, I can't determine if this is George Amp or not, but this is the rumor. So we'll just show the video. And, okay. And everybody can make their own judgment on it. Started putting this kind of thing down, and uh, he's going to put it in time and put the mail in the coffin. Not if we can help it. But there's Jamil. Well, they're both Marxists. Um, well, going door to door in this video, a citizen appears to be criticizing please, 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 Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and his father Pierre. To opposition leader Pierre Polyev, in which the Tory responds back by calling both men a Marxist. The viral video has sparked many comments online, including from Liberal MP Mark Garriston, who calls the claim a massive misunderstanding of the term and an insult. But I certainly don't think that Justin Trudeau is a, is a Marxist in a genuine, deep ideological sense. I think it was just used as a pejorative term designed to signal both his economic orientation, which has to do with distributing wealth from those who have more wealth to those who have less wealth, uh, as well as his cultural orientation. Today, some experts are pushing back on Polyev's statement, who say Marxism in its traditional sense is criticism towards capitalism and the conflict between social classes. The term refers to the belief system of Karl Marx, a 19th century revolutionary socialist in Europe. I don't know if that was George Ann Burke. Again, that was the rumor. I don't know the woman. I, I honestly, you know, but it's, it's been, I've been reading about it a lot, but I honestly don't think it's her. I, I don't, I, I really don't believe it's her. Uh, looking at the video and looking at pictures of her and seeing her, I, I don't think it's the same person. Mm -hmm. Now, according to something called the Pathway Group, George Ann Burke is a seasoned veteran of political activities in the United States and Canada, has spent the t past 10 years at the time of this thing being right, written in a variety of roles with the Conservative Party of Canada and in the offices of ministers and MPs for specific areas of expertise, was an outreach and uh, outreach to cultural communities, uh, spent three years in the office of MP Rob Clark, all that kind of stuff. Um, here's a photo of her from the face. Now, of course, in this video, we don't really see this lady. Um, yeah, I don't. I on. don't. I don't think it's her, to be honest. I really don't. A lot of people are yeah. saying it, but I, I just don't see it. Yeah. So. I mean, it doesn't take away from the fact that she's a pretty horrible person, but I just don't see it. I don't think that's her in the video. 
Yeah. So there you, you go. So Giovanni. La 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 Now, according to polls right now, it seems that Giovanni's a shoe in to win this electoral district. It also doesn't help that the conservatives have owned it for pretty much the last two decades. So, um, so I would see a, a, a kit actually sent this to me and it's like, I think the prime minister may have erred. It's not so much that Giovanni's a twofer. He's probably more of a bogo. Buy one, get one. Buy him, get Pierre. Buy one ball face, shameless liar, get two. Yes. Just saying. <sighs> he should lose this by-election. He should, given the sheer ballsiness of his lie. But unfortunately, we appear to live in an era in which bold mendacity is rewarded over, ironically, merit. Considering mm. that the Conservative Party alleges that it is the party of merit. And just for shits and giggles, someone did a web search through Hansard mm -hmm. for a twofer. There have been seven instances since 2007 of the use of and, twofer. And which, which party was primarily using that work? All parties. All parties. Oh, okay. Yes. And all of them, well, actually all of them, none of them have any racial connotation. Funny how that is. Eh? If you want to ask me what I think, I think industrial benefits are an excellent practice that in fact basically got developed in this country years ago. And now other countries have caught on. We get a twofer out of it. We get the equipment we need and we also get investment. And conservatives managed to score a twofer, ensuring that not only would the deficit add up to somewhere around 150 billion new borrowed dollars, but that the infrastructure deficit, which includes the social infrastructure deficit, the road infrastructure deficit, and the, trans the transit infrastructure, blah, blah, blah. Because even on our show, Kits and Cubs, even on our show, we used the word twofer. I have used the word twofer, which, uh, Mr. Grizzly, upon finding out that, um, well, apparently it's nice. I had used a Sorry. racist term, allegedly, allegedly. Uh, yes. provoked me to have to, because you know, on this show, Mr. Grizzly, um, we do, um, issue gentle corrections on ourselves when we do something wrong. Mm -hmm. So, um, if you uh, would, Mr. Grizzly, uh, I would like to, because, you know, we don't hide. I'd like to make this apology, uh, fully public. Let's see if we can hear you though. Oh yeah. Yeah. You're right. That just hit play and let's right. see if it works. Yeah. No sound. It doesn't work. Okay. Yeah. Send me the I link. On, I keep on forgetting that that's the case. Yeah, I don't know why so, that is. See, I was trying to make this all smooth for one way, and I was doing so well until I forgot. Tech hates me. <laughs> I was doing so well. It happens. But yes, because we believe in transparency, right? We we are facts first that we give our opinion and if we're wrong about something we are wrong about something um so yeah and well here we go kits and cubs hello kits and cubs this is your eager beaver here from the beaver lodge with another beaver tales for you recently on our show we referred to the federal government's policy of eliminating carbon pricing on home heating fuel as a twofer we thought that this was a very clever way to present the policy to you because well encouraging canadians to switch to heat pumps would reduce the amount of co2 being pumped into the air because home heating fuel is the most carbon intensive way of heating your home and because switching to heat pumps also generates lots of economic savings and you know we are kind of in an affordability crisis. Well, we thought that being able to 
give Canadians savings so that they can spend more on lodging and food, healthcare, transportation, education, and stuff of the like was a very smart thing. The policy acted on two fronts. We called it a twofer. Today online, thanks to Jamel Giovanni, Pierre Polyev, and Jenny Byrne, and a lot of their friends, we learned that the term twofer is racist. We had no idea when we used it, and we are so, so very sorry. So, by way of this video, we would like to apologize to Canada's fossil fuel community. Coal, home heating fuel, natural gas, we are so sorry for associating you with such a racist term. And to policy from coast to coast to coast, we apologize for referring to you as a twofer. It, it was wrong. We feel terrible about it. And to try and make it up to you, for the next month, we here at the Beaver Lodge commit to fueling ourselves with nothing but natural gas and to not use our heat pump at all. It's symbolic, we know, and it probably won't be enough to make up for the damage we've caused. But we hope that by doing so, you will know that we are sincere. Again, we are so sorry. So ashamed. <laughs> I, I, I would have put not at the end, but that's me. We like, we like to do better, kids. Mm -hmm. I'll just have a little sip here. Pretend it's tea. Mm. All right. <laughs> oh my god jeez <sighs> these people and um just to, since we talked about michelle ferrari this is um um i have to admit that this is just outright gratuitous on my part but <laughs> well i mean you know you gotta hit back right? <laughs> um she uh, had a big post here, if you'll put it up here, Mr. Grizzly. It says, everyone can support affordable child care because remember, she's the shadow critic. Not a man. <laughs> <laughs> On like families and all that kind of stuff, right? So everyone can support affordable child care. That's why we're running on eliminating it. But the liberals are not delivering that. They have delivered chaos. And blah, 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 blah. And she shows a picture of herself. Now, sitting across the table from a child who she's trying to engage. She's got this big style and the smile on her. And this child is not having it. Like, not having it at all. I think this is hilarious. And it's, is it like this? This kid looked like she could smell Michelle's drecketude from across the table. Mm. <laughs> now, if you don't know what drecketude is, because everything I need to know in life, I learned from Tyra Banks on America's Next Top Model. <laughs> it comes from that show. The drecketude from the Urban Dictionary, noun used to describe something that is a wreck and absolute trash or rubbish, comes from wreck dreck and attitude combined in reference to anything from exaggerated and overinflated claims a bad personality and especially horrible style or awful modeling and everything in between that kid is like mm. it's the first time i've heard that word girl i can smell you <laughs> totally gratuitous I know. I'm only a beaver. Mm. Some days I'm weak. <laughs> now, speaking of taking shots, <clears throat> recently, somebody that I think we both love, mm. Supriya Devetti. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She, she, she was vicious this weekend. I loved it. Uh, yes. She held nothing back. Yes. She was brought into the prime minister's office as a senior advisor. And uh, this weekend she had a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> she was vicious. Fun. She was, ooh. I, there was a couple of times I was like, ooh. Yeah. Oh, wow. So we have a situation where we have a lady who is extremely accomplished 
and happens to be a visible minority mm-hmm. and a liberal at the same time. So we know conservatives love that. <laughs> so accomplished. Well, sorry, all three accomplished, mm-hmm. educated. So all four. Oh my God. She's like hitting all the sensitive touchy spots. Accomplished, educated, female, liberal, and visible minority. And well, pardon my language, but Supriya Devetti is the type of person who doesn't give a fuck who your daddy is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so she has been dishing it out. She has been serving it up to conservatives the way that conservatives serve it up all the time. And the conservatives have been swelling up and falling apart. It's like, oh my God, how unprofessional. Oh my God, I can't believe you said that you used a sexual term. This this from the party that spent most of the past few years portraying the prime minister as a groper, uh, pedophile, right? Why did he really leave that school? Um, who is pro genocide, uh, racist, uh, a dictator without like wondering why it is they get to call the prime minister of a nation a dictator several times a day on internet and nobody's yet rounded them up and throw them into a gulag? Because actual dictators tend to be a little touchy about being called dictators in public and actual dictators usually don't have minority parliaments and actual dictators don't actually tend to share a little bit of power with another party supplying confidence agreement anyone Mm -hmm. um but yeah apparently they get offended when somebody decides to uh dish it out so we have crybaby caillou here of course going a senior advisor in the Prime Minister's office, Supriya Devetti, has unleashed a series of vile, sexually explicit posts on social media. Nothing short of her termination and an apology from the Prime Minister's chief of staff is required. Now, remember, this is the guy during the COVID quarantines when it was found that somebody had been sexually assaulted at one of the hotels that were used for quarantine, decided to get himself quarantined. Uh, at such a hotel to see if he would be raped and then present all these videos said i'm in this quarantine thing and you know i've placed the chair under my door because oh right this guy that actually made fun Mm. mocked rape just let that sink in yeah saying that nothing short of her termination and apology is required for what she did. So let's take a look at what she did. Well, it seems that Canada proud because they love educated, visible minority liberal women who are very successful and accomplished who are not afraid to speak their minds. (coughs) Hello, Jeff. Um, Canada Proud live coverage of a PMO staffer having a public meltdown continues Supriya Devetti ah yes we're in public meltdown means responding to tweets that a random man has tagged me in great stuff as always from the incel adjacent crowd Canada Proud did Rachel Gelmore hack your account oh wait a minute they attacked two women wouldn't that be a twofer Yep. Supriya Devetti. Oh, God, I forgot you guys have a raging boner for her. I get it. She's hot, but she has a boyfriend and is not interested. I promise you. (laughs) Now, apparently her saying that they have a raging boner. um, Yeah, I guess. Apparently is sexually explicit. And then. After that, man, how long until Katie Tops tells you to stop tweeting? Oh, a third woman, a threefer on this one. Supriya, probably around the time you're able to make a woman come, so never. 
I do have to pick my daughter up from my sister-in-law's place in like an hour though, so we'll stop checking Twitter then. <laughs> to which one of the minions, Ew, what a disgusting way to talk. I get that you're on your personal time, but this is gross and embarrassing. You really should take that break. Again, this from the minions that when Bianca Andrescu was having that big public ceremony because she was the first Canadian to win a Grand Slam singles title mm -hmm. and the prime minister was right next to her and they were having a little chat and seemed to be giggling and having fun, then took those pictures and said, oh my God, look how close. If he was getting that close to my daughter, I would have cuffed him one. Suggesting that he was trying to get handsy with a young lady on a stage in front of how many thousands of people with cameras rolling in front of his wife. Mm -hmm. yeah. But this offends them. Well, don't tell me to stop when you can make someone come. It's, it's one of the, uh, one of the replies I, I, I read is, uh, Oh no, the woman said a thing and the right wing Twitter is all a flutter demonstrating. They can dish it out, but can't take it. Yes. And as a, uh, yeah, as Kitlin M says, this from the, Fuck Trudeau flag people? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then um, oh, then we get Sarah Fisher. What is going on in the BMO comms department? The level of unhinged and extreme gaslighting paranoia and faint outrage that we've seen in the few days is both shocking and comical. We are witnessing an implosion of astronomical proportions. Popcorn emoji. Uh, unhinged, extreme gaslighting, paranoia, feigned outrage? Like... Isn't that your stock and trade, lady? Aren't aren't you the person that approved the calm strategy of Jamil Javadi, mm -hmm. claiming that Tufer and the words ideologue and insider were racist? So suddenly, all of a sudden, this is this is the one. This is the stuff that kills me. It's all of a sudden, all <laughs> of a sudden, they're they're they the the right wing. They're, Radical gender ideology people are suddenly saying, gee, if I didn't know better, I would read this post as both an attack on we are Canada proud sexual orientation and an assumption of their gender. I suppose if I give you the benefit of not being a bigot, it's possible you are a bit fixated on female ejaculations. Perhaps this is why you will not be checking from your sister-in-laws. Well, I won't judge you for your preferences. There's a whole lot of confusion in that statement. <laughs> like... Absolutely. And then, of course, Crybaby Caillou. If this is how Justin Trudeau's most trusted staffers speak in public, I wonder what they say in private. Supra, you're going to want to delete some tweets when you sober up. <clears throat> wow. So all of a sudden, the, the, the people who are oh, they're teaching radical gender ideology are suddenly defending gender ideology. <laughs> now we have kit james asking in the chat here are we just going to let douglas's dirtiest comment ever go unnoticed i do not know what that one was yeah, so please i if i said it i missed it and i'm might really sad i did it because... might have been a quote you were reading possibly i don't know <laughs> <laughs> and of course jenny byrne was out there and going oh my god so unprofessional this from the lady who trademarked the term tripping over their dicks. <laughs> Are we all watching the shame show here? <laughs> I don't know. Oh my God. Y'all got to swell up and fall apart. One woman, one woman wakes up one day and decides to serve you up for a couple of minutes what you've been serving up for the last years. Yeah. Oh, no. The world is melting down. It's so terrible. <laughs> oh, crap. And speaking of Sarah Fisher saying, the level of unhitched extreme gaslighting paranoia and faint outrage that we've seen in the few days is both shocking and, and comical? Well... Oh, mm. Please allow me to uh, put a little uh, towel over my uh, arm and place sommelier and present you with the CPC wine, W H I N E, selection of the day. It would appear 
that um, the liberals and the NDP, who, remember, signed a supply and confidence agreement mm-hmm. a couple of years ago, right? 2022. Yeah. Um, there was more than one thing in that agreement that mm-hmm. they said they were going to do. Now, we focused on pharmacare and dental because those were the two big items. But there was a couple of other things in there. And uh, one of those things had to do with, you know, elections. Making it easier to vote, Mm -hmm. for example. I mean, they certainly didn't agree to impose proportional representation on the nation because... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> they tried that before, and, uh, well, we all know how that worked. Didn't work. Right? When the prime minister tried to change the way that we voted, and all four parties decided to get together and to not allow that to happen in any way, shape, or form. And then blamed him for it. <laughs> and blamed him for it. So we know that any type of reform to elections, we're going to call electoral reform, is probably not going to include anything whatsoever with regard to the way that the votes are counted. Right? So, there was an article in CTV stating that, well, you know, they were working on electoral reform. Now, specifically, the Liberals and New Democrats, it says here in the article, agreed to explain Lore, quote, allowing an expanded three-day voting period during general elections. So general election day wouldn't be one, would probably be three on a weekend. Mm. Allowing voters to cast their ballots at any polling place within their riding. Instead of just one. So when you get your little card, or says you have to go to polling station 175 specifically in your riding, this well if there's another one that happens to actually be closer to you and it's still in your writing you could do it there and three improving the mail-in ballot process with both accessibility and maintaining integrity in mind that's it that's it those are the things that they are agreeing to explore and it would probably require some legislation Now, apparently, these three little things have been labeled as trying to rig elections and cheat and trying to make it easier for immigrants. Ooh, your racist slip is showing from voting. To vote like this. Probably trying to change some immigration law so that, you know, you can approve a whole bunch of citizenships really quickly. Get a little look on that. Takes about 24 months, beginning to end, for a citizenship application to be approved. There currently is a backlog in the system of about 50,000, so they're already behind on yeah. those 24 months. And there are fewer than two years until the next election. And if they were to do that, that would also involve a legislative process. And while we know one party would certainly not be cooperative in making that happen, right? So by the time such a law would occur, um, there'd be way, way, way less than the less than two years, fewer than two years that we have now. Mm -hmm. So I think Canadians are safe. You know, this big alleged plot to allow a whole bunch of immigrants well, become means- citizens a whole lot faster so that they can vote in the next election because being granted citizenship, you know, comes with the obligation of voting liberal, apparently. Yes, yes, yes. If you're not going to vote liberal, we won't give you your citizenship. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently, <clears throat> all of these things, allowing people to vote three days on general election day instead of one, allowing voters to cast their ballots at any polling place within their writing and improving the mail-in ballot process with both accessibility and maintaining integrity in mind is rigging an election and setting it up to cheat to 
win. Now, this is another communication strategy that the Conservative Party and all the minions have ran with, I assume approved by Sarah Fisher, who was talking about gaslighting and paranoia and... Hello? Kettle? Cauldron called? You're black. <laughs> I'm just, uh. And fortunately, there is an expert because we love experts. So, you know, this guy is going to get lamb basted by the conservatives mm. named Dwayne Bratt. And Dwayne Bratt is a professor of political science at Mount Royal University. And he put up a little thread that I'd like to read for you kids. And if you want to put it up, you can. I, I did a thread reader app on it. Um, oh, Kit Linda goes, does that make the pot a twofer? Ooh, <laughs> Linda. <laughs> 15 beaver points. <laughs> I love that. Mr. Bratt, Professor Bratt said, I am hearing concern that the Liberal NDP are working together to make electoral changes on the eve of a federal election that would rig it in their favor. It is based on this article, CTV article, titled mm -hmm. Trudeau and Singh's Teams Quietly Planning Electoral Reform Legislation. Gee, that makes it sound so sinister, doesn't it? Especially the word quietly planning. Right? Rather than Trudeau and Singh following up on comply, supply and confidence agreement uh, point, principle, whatever that's in there, to make elections more accessible. Trudeau and Singh teams quietly planning electoral reform legislation. Words matter, kids. Framing matters. Yes. This thread offers some analysis. The proposed changes are all about increasing access to voting. This should not be controversial, but as I discuss later, has become so. Making it easier to vote, multiple days of voting, vote anywhere measures, increasing mail-in voting, are generally really popular among the public. Look at the increase in every election with advanced voting. People want to vote when they want to vote. Many countries already have multiple days of voting. Allowing people to vote at any polling place within their electoral district has been done in municipal elections in Canada. In fact, you could vote at any advanced poll in a city. Mail-in ballots were common in the U.S. for years. That is true. When we have advanced polling, you're allowed to vote anywhere. Uh, Kit James says not, not nearly enough tabs open. There are literally only 10 on this screen. That's a record Normally, for you. There are like 40 or 50. Yeah, that's so, a record um, for you. <laughs> I should literally be commended today <laughs> for my restraint. <laughs> I'm just saying, everything is relative to what came before. <laughs> and I've actually opened a few since the show started. I had fewer when we started. These types of changes were explicitly part of the liberal NDP confidence and supply agreement. And he actually then takes... A screen cap of the part of the agreement that was made public. Point number seven, making democracy work for people. Recognizing our shared commitment to maintaining the health of our democracy and the need to remove barriers to voting and participation, we will work with Elections Canada to explore ways to expand the ability for people to vote, such as an expanded election day of three days of voting, allowing people to vote at any polling place within their electoral district improving the process of mail-in ballots to ensure that voters who choose this method of voting are not disenfranchised. We commit to ensuring that Quebec's number of seats in the House of Commons remains constant. So this thing that's just happening now and very, very quietly that they all told us about two years ago and made yeah. public. Yeah. 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 Oh, sorry. Yes, 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 yes. yes. James, sorry, I misread. Not nearly enough tabs open. That was a commendation. I misread. Gentle correction issued upon myself. <laughs> Gentle. I had misread. I had misread. Thank you. Thank you for noticing my effort. Well, I love you. 
to add <laughs> to, add to uh, the conversation, I'm going to put this on the screen quickly because this falls in line with what Linda asked a little bit earlier. Was it Linda who asked the question? Let's see. I, oh no, it was it was it was Bridget actually. It was oh. Miss Fox. I would love to know what Doug Ford. I would love to know what Doug Ford studied for three weeks in college. I'm guessing it wasn't feminist cultural studies. <laughs> well, it goes along with this. How was I supposed to know that letting colleges set up in strip malls and enrolling hundreds of thousands of international students with no housing for them would be an issue? This stuff never happened when I went to Humber College for a couple of weeks in 1984. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's remember that because th that's a parallel to another piece of news that I oh, have. Yeah. But 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 keep that keep that one handy. Yeah, it's that's there. Yeah, right. Keep that keep that one handy. We'll, we'll come back to that one. So now apparently they're trying like they're all trying to frame this as look they're doing this now on the eve of an election. Uh, the professor reminds us Canada is not on the eve of an election. The Liberal NDP confidence supply agreement negotiated in March 2022 is set to expire in June 2025. We are still in January 2024, kids. Yeah, we got some time left on that. Yeah. Obviously, in a minority situation, government could fall at any moment, but the Liberal NDP confidence supply agreement gives certainty for at least another year and a half, and my guess is that we will be voting in fall of 2025. Unfortunately, we are in a polarized environment where any government that introduces changes to elections is automatically viewed suspiciously. And you can see that in the tweets that are going around, that, oh my God, that they're choosing to do this now is suspicious. It's not. It's not. Because mail-in voting has always been at the center of election faith. Just because you guys decided to choose to say that mail-in voting allows bigger cheating doesn't mean that it does. Just because you guys, who are of bad faith, say that mail-in voting affects election faith does not make it so just saying also because of spillover from the u.s especially trump fears that increasing access slash ease of voting is designed to support progressive parties in short one these changes are about increasing ease slash access to voting which i support Two, they were telegraphed almost two years ago. Three, we are still likely over one and a half years away from an election. Four, conservative supporters may be suspicious of changes. Thank you, Professor, for telling us what time it is. So, kids and cubs, yeah, if you see online all this BS that, oh my God, they're about to read the election. You now have the information you need to immunize yourself hmm. against the gaslighting. Ooh, vaccination talk. Ooh. And to counter the BS. As they said and sang in the little in the best little whorehouse in Texas, a lot of goodwill and maybe one small thrill, but there's nothing dirty going on. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of people are really paranoid and upset by the concept of Canadians voting. I mean, gee, it's not like we haven't been talking for all decades about low voter turnout and ways that we can encourage people or make it so that people would participate in the process. Apparently, this is a brand new discussion. Well... Apparently. And some people are really shocked. You don't need three voting days. Everybody knows you vote on general election day. That's it. This makes it suspicious. Shall I prepare thee a fainting couch and smelling salts for when you realize that uh, we've had more than one voting day for a long time when you add advanced voting days uh, in the last election, 2021, we had four of them. Mm -hmm. And then that you had to order your mail-in ballot last election by September 14th for an election on the 21st, I think it was, so long that it was in, in time to be counted. So that means if you missed the four advanced voting days, September 10th to 13th, but you had a mail-in ballot and you filled it in on the 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th, 
and were able to get it into the office in time for the vote from the 21st. And then we had voting day that we had something like 11 voting days the last time around. Mm. But y'all think that we just had one. It's it's the <laughs> gaslighting on this whole thing is just enough to make me want to scream. It's like, it's just, how, how do they just continue to get away with lying? Constant lying, constant, constant bullshit and never being taken to task for it. Are we the only ones holding them responsible for their lies? There's got to be somebody out there somewhere doing it. It can't be just us. Wait, wait till these people find out we had 11 voting days last time around. Oh my God. Oh my God. I had another one saying Elon uh, tweeted to Elon Musk because there was like a hashtag, I stand with Trudeau. Mm. Had 9,314 or something tweets associated with it. Elon Musk, are you doing something about the bots? There's no way that there's 9,314 people in Canada who support Trudeau. It's like, wait till this guy figures out that in the last election, over 5.5 million Canadians voted for the Liberal Party. He's upset by 9,340. <laughs> wow, is he in for a shock. <laughs> Somebody catches him before he bumps his head when he falls. Mm. <laughs> and then you have the director of communication saying that <laughs> we're the people who are paranoid. <laughs> Oh, girl, you're too much. <laughs> it's just absurd. Oh, my God. Oh, these people's children. Oh, it's <laughs> where. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. Then, if none of that was enough, um, we also had proof, incontrovertible proof, that a prime minister... Pierre Troliev would be a colossal disaster. Uh, we mentioned a couple of weeks ago that there was a court case being brought to the International Court of Justice by South Africa against Israel for what's going on to try to get an order from the International Court of Justice to tell Israel to impose a ceasefire on itself. The case has been argued, and the ICJ has come down with the decision. The ICJ did not order Israel to impose a ceasefire on itself, but it did suggest or ordered or ruled that they should really probably be making way more of an effort to make sure that random Palestinians just don't end up dead. Hmm. Well, in conjunction with that, we have found, and let's remember, kids, again, as we mentioned on the show, and this is not my term, somebody else had said it, that there is a difference between the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, and the ICC, the International Criminal Court. The International Criminal Court is where people go to get redress. The International Criminal Court of Justice is where nations go. Mm -hmm. And the ICJ's rulings basically have no teeth. Every they time can't you're, really be enforced. Every time you say ICJ, I keep thinking ICP. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> a clown posse. Yes. So, parallel to this, we got news and this is very, very, very disturbing news that an organization that goes by UNRWA, you may have heard of it, but its full name is the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees, mm. that there's a big controversy there. It seems that there are 12 employees of that agency that have or are very much suspected of having provided assistance in some ways to Hamas 
in the planning of the October 7 massacre in Israel. I did read that the other day. As a result of that, four nations immediately suspended funding to UNRWA. The United States, Australia, Canada, and Italy. They were joined a couple of days later by UK and Finland, and then the next day by Germany. I don't know if more have joined since then. Now, the ICJ warned Israel to protect civilians, but didn't call for the ceasefire, as we mentioned. Now, this has created some particular controversy in Canada because Stephen Harper, back in the day, there was suspicions back in the day that there might be some people working at UNRWA that were helping Hamas in different ways or, or supportive of, uh, of Hamas. And Prime Minister Stephen Harper cut funding to UNRWA mm-hmm. permanently. Our Prime Minister reestablished it during his term. So, during his little uh, rally pep talk to his caucus, the leader of his majesty's allegedly loyal official opposition suggested that the prime minister of Canada is responsible for the October 7th massacre in Israel because he had reestablished funding to UNRWA. Now, If you take that little piece of information in isolation, Mm -hmm. you can see how people would want to spin that and run with it. But as we like to do on the show, we like to take domestic pieces of information and put them in the global context of comparing them to our near peer countries like the United States, Australia, Italy, UK, Finland, and Germany, who also were funding UNRWA. If you are running to a mic and making the suggestion that nations and leaders of nations that have provided funding to UNRWA are responsible for having caused the October 7th massacre and other nations that have funded UNRWA are the United States, Australia, Australia, Italy, UK, Finland, and Germany, Mm-hmm. And let's just set all the other nations aside and just think about the United States in particular. The United States funded UNRWA to the tune of $422 million U.S. last year. So if you go to a mic and say, hey, Because he didn't say this, but this is what it means, right? Because Mm -hmm. the Prime Minister did it and the President of the United States did it, then they both did the same thing. So if you're going to a mic and saying, hey, leader of our biggest ally and biggest trading partner and people that we rely on for our national defense and security, like a lot, you caused the massacre inferring that you might be an anti-Semite. How does that work out for international diplomatic relations and trade relations down the road? Not very good. Um, that's actually quite bad. Uh, and I'm not uh, well-versed in international trade or diplomacy because, you know, I'm just a dumb guy in Ottawa, but uh, I'm going to say that's probably not very good. <laughs> Probably not very good for maintaining Canada as the freest nation on the planet, right? When you piss mm-hmm. off your protector. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah that's you nice. accuse them of being anti-Semites and having caused a massacre? Yeah. So, on the same weekend that this man couldn't be bothered to show up at the state funeral for Ed Broadbent, he was addressing his party, indirectly suggesting that all of our important allies like Australia, Italy, the UK, Finland, Germany, and our most important international ally, the United States of America, all had a hand in causing the October 7th massacre in Israel. 
and are all anti-Semites. Uh-huh. This man is not a statesman. No. And this man will always, always, always put himself above the nation. These are things you do not do. And if you needed any more proof that Pierre Polyev would be a colossal fuck up, that's putting as a it prime mildly. minister, he had just have it right there. He well, would have created an international incident if he was prime minister and had said that. I just, uh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> plain and simple. I just put a link to his unhinged twenty-five minute uh, <laughs> screed. Screed. I don't know what else to call it. Uh, anybody who wants to check it out, it's in the chat. You can click on it after after we go off the air. You might want to set yourself up with an Alka Seltzer or something because. Yes. And, and I know a lot of people go, "Oh, I don't want to interrupt." Listen. Do listen. Yeah. You need to know what it is they're saying. You need to know how bad it is. And it's bad. It's really that's bad. why you need to vote, and that's why you need to bring friends with you to vote. Because this type of shit has got to stop. Well, has <clears throat> got to stop. One of the comments here on on his twenty five minute screed, his gentleman uh, Paul D. Uh, he slip. Just watch Polyev's uh, caucus speech. 25 minutes of lies, slanderous slurs, and more bullshit fake Mustafa-like characters and stories. Even if you despise PP, everyone should watch this to see the craziness that he is selling to the CPC MPs. Mm -hmm. and, it, and he's standing in front of a podium that has common sense written on it. Yes, and apparently in this thing, he uh, accuses the Prime Minister of somehow being responsible for auto thefts because recently it came to the news that there's a lot of auto, auto thefts and then it's been going on refers to it again later on into the video and apparently the way that he talked about it there was somebody that had the same car stolen two times i'm guessing or <laughs> different it, yeah if if you're the type of person that's a little pedantic and likes continu continuity you'll see that the story just like cannot possibly make sense no, it's just rambling Yes, but it's, now um, it's, uh, this comment here from Tavi. Um, I didn't get to see the show yet. I was watching football, but I will check it out later. If anyone watched Nate on the breakdown last night, you will understand why Pierre Polyev is becoming louder in his lies. He's being enabled. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, just to close off on this Hamas thing, um, these accusations against the twelve people, the Secretary General of the UN, Antonio Guterres, Guterres, finally came out yesterday to address it. Until then, it had been his spokesperson and his director of communications. His director of communications had encouraged nations that had cut funding to UNRWA to reestablish it because he had described it as collective punishment, mm. which is a bit of a no-no under international law. But, you know, when the UN has an organization in which 12 of its members, which is a small number, of course, but have been helped people do things that are really 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 not good mm -hmm. because i think it's only normal that people would suspend funding for a little bit to see not how you know what you're going to do to get your place in order a bit so of the 12 the secretary general has confirmed yesterday that nine have been fired one is dead mm. That made my ears break up. And the other two, well, their involvement is still being assessed to see whether or not they did help or not. An investigation has been launched. And he said specifically, the spokesperson, the quote, any employee of UNRWA who was involved in acts of terror will be held accountable, including through criminal prosecution. So uh, they are working very hard to try and... Uh, clean that up but uh yeah no bueno not good public relations disaster and they do have some work to do to clean that up mm. now um that thing that you mentioned about um uh, doug ford mm -hmm. because 
in this UNRWA thing, we talked about a policy that was in place that the prime minister removed, Harper policy removed. Yes. Well, that professional college thing. Premier Kathleen Wynne, when she was Premier of Ontario. She shut them down. Yeah. And Doug Ford brought them back. Uh, like in his first week. Yeah. And now it's coming back to bite him in the ass. Yeah. Because they're, they're, they're not even uh, diploma mills, these places. They're, they're not even DeVry, right? They're not even DeVry. So, and of course, with the cap that's going to happen on international mm -hmm. student visas, reducing them by a third, the overwhelming majority of them come to Ontario. And since, and this is not just Doug Ford, but successive governments in Ontario have not been doing what they need to do to get universities to build student housing. And these professional colleges certainly weren't required to provide mm -hmm. any housing whatsoever. Well, now they're all wondering how they're going to fund themselves because, well, they've been Oopsie. relying on that international money. Oopsie. I would love to see a list of shareholders in these companies. Mm -hmm. Now, Doug Ford is sitting on a certain number of billions in surplus, so I'm sure he could bail out those universities yeah. for having approved. And this is where, again, we mentioned on the last show, right, where we're having a little thing where everybody's saying, well, you know, Justin Trudeau like this, approved their permit, so it's his fault. No, 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 no. The people that approved the licenses for these colleges to operate. Provincial. And then allowed them to operate the way that they did without having any obligation on them whatsoever to provide housing for the people they mm -hmm. were bringing in. Yeah. That's on you, Doug. Premier Ford, that's on you. Our premiers are the problem. We keep saying it. Well, it makes me, reminds me of this. Canada isn't broken. It's being dismantled by conservatives. Indeed. Indeed. In other news, a little bit south of the border this time. I have um, a commentary to add, though. Oh, sure. So this past weekend, as I told you earlier, we went to a spa. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a nice uh, suite. It was beautiful. We had a great time. But we were sitting in one of the hot tubs, and uh, Bridget and I were sitting there just chatting. There were some people next to us chatting. And there were three young women who were, uh, they were having a nice conversation. And uh, they, one of them, they were, one of the two of them were trying to teach the other one how to swim because she didn't really know how to swim. And it's a hot tub, so it's not deep, right? But you can you can swim in it. They're big. They're they're huge pools. They weren't making a tremendous amount of noise. What? The um, I don't know. Would you call them security? I don't know if they're security, but a gentleman approached these three young women. Three young black women mm. and told them you're making too much noise and he did it was it twice or three times three times so we started to speak up and make noise and guess what happened to us nothing oh not a goddamn thing so i told those young ladies that i would be bringing it up on the show on monday morning and I told another group of young white ladies who were also making a lot of noise but never got shushed the same thing. I said they would never say that to me, and they didn't. But the three young French-Canadian black women, now we were in Quebec, so, and, and the staff was all French uh, and English. They're all bilingual. Was, but it, it, it was... <sighs> The first time I'm like, did that just happen? And the, and the young ladies were like, yeah. Like, this is a normal thing for them. And I'm like, that's unacceptable. Then it happened two more times. It's like, okay, man. This is horse shit. This is blatant racism. Hmm. Because there were a lot of other people in the pool talking louder and making more noise. But nobody told them to be quiet. And... We even, 
it wasn't even a quiet pool. And we talked to the other folks who were in the pool and they were all on the, we were all on the same thing. Like, this is horse shit. This, this is wrong. So, yeah, management will be getting a um, tersely worded email from me. Good. Because I'm not going to sit back and let that happen. And, you know, I said I would make mention of it on the show so that we can let the folks know over at the uh, Koina Spa that uh, there's some nefarious things going on and you might want to address it because that is not cool. I'm glad you did mention it, Miss Grizzly. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for doing that. Well, like Hugh says right here, you have to name it when we see it. So I'm calling it out because I saw it. Yep. And I, 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 I'd loudly said, I bet you he wouldn't say that to me, knowing he could hear me. Didn't even look at me. Didn't even look at me. And I walked over after he gave them another one, and I'm saying, this is horse shit. Enough of this. This is garbage. And he heard me say that, too. Didn't even look at me. Of course, I was standing there in a Speedo, so that might have frightened him. <laughs> <laughs> that one has levels. Uh, <laughs> well. <laughs> oh, south of us. <clears throat> Little development in the lives and times of uh, Trumpito Citolini. Um, a while ago, a lady named E. Jean Carroll became one of the first people, if not the first person, to successfully sue the man. Mm -hmm. And do oblivion. And she got about $5 million out of him that time mm -hmm. because um, he had sexually assaulted her. Now, the official ruling was sexual assault and not rape because mm -hmm. she was honest in the trial and said that she wasn't sure. And trigger warning here. Mm -hmm wasn't sure whether or not she had been penetrated by fingers or something else. Right. And apparently in New York state law, if you're not sure which it is, mm -hmm. then it's sex, it's sexual assault and not and rape. rape yeah. But later on, right, there's a judge that basically said, it's like, yeah, he basically tried to sue her for def defamation afterwards for having said it was rape, and it's like, he just like looked at her and was like, girl, come on. It's like, technically, in the law, a sexual assault, but you raped her. Mm -hmm. So, after having had that judgment, he literally went out that very day and defamed her again, said that she was lying. I don't know her, never met her, she's lying, blah, blah, blah. I assumed, said a lot of things about her character, all that kind of stuff. So she took him to court again. Oh, did she ever? <laughs> and, well, the jury apparently needed fewer than three hours to come to the conclusion that he is once again G-U-I-L-T-Y. Guilty. 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 Guilty, 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 and awarded to her because originally she was awarded five million, seven point three million dollars for the emotional harm, plus eleven million dollars to help her repair her reputation, and then an extra sixty-five <laughs> million dollars in punitive punitive damages for a total of eighty-three point something million 83 she started with five he kept running his mouth and it cost him another 83 not to mention all his lawyer fees <laughs> that he won't pay is he going to cough up the 83 uh, he's a billionaire right Probably not anymore. Well, apparently, Mar a Lago is <laughs> only worth twenty-five if ever million. He was, if ever he was. Apparently, Mar a Lago is only worth twenty-five million. Yes. So uh, she can afford to buy Mar a Lago now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it would be great. I have to sell it anyway. <laughs> you know, it would be great if she bought it and turned it into public housing. Oh. <laughs> with a with a woman's shelter there. Yes. So of course, um, 
Trump's lawyer, Alina Haba, said immediately that she's going to appeal and, you know, put a whole bunch of stuff, said a whole bunch of stuff like this. And, um, well, Alina Haba made some headlines recently because she was asked in an interview, would she rather be smart or rather be pretty? And she says, I'd rather be pretty because I can fake being smart. <laughs> Apparently not well enough. <laughs> you just lost a major case. So it's like I'm thinking, Alina Haba, for when there was a time you could afford the very best, but you're such a shit gibbon and terrible client that no one else will hire you, and this is what you get. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I see that Kit Mohan is saying that Mateo is sending hearts to Douglas and Paul. We are sending them back. Hey, my little man, right here. Boom, 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 boom. Boom, boom. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mateo. We send you love. We hope that you're doing really well. We hope that you have a really, really fun week at school planned. Amen. Mm, big kisses. I love that kid. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Uh, also, uh, in a little bit of international news, uh, it'll be very interesting. It seems that Turkey has finally agreed to Sweden becoming a part of NATO. Yeah. Uh, as also reported on the show, uh, Turkey was trying a little power play with the United States, saying, uh, well, we need some F-16 fighter jets, so uh, sell us those jets and we'll approve uh, Sweden being becoming part of NATO in the United States. <laughs> yeah, that's not how we play it. Say, so you approve Sweden being part of NATO. And then maybe you get the jets. Maybe. It seems that Turkey... Yielded on that one. Well, surprise, surprise, surprise. So now it seems that there is a deal. The United States has agreed that it will sell some F-16 fighter jets to Turkey after Turkey allowed Sweden to join NATO. They'll also be selling some F-16 fighter jets to Greece, but Greece had no problem with Turkey. <laughs> Sweden yeah. joining NATO, so that was fine. So it seems that there's only one country that still opposes Sweden joining NATO in the EU. And I gave you three guesses as to which one it is. I, I honestly am drawing a blank. Oops. Who is former premier, thankfully, former prime minister, Stephen Harper's oh, best buddy? Yeah. 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 Soccer. <laughs> It seems that Hungary is not looking for some F-16 fighter jets, I guess. So uh, I'm guessing there's going to have to be another way <laughs> to get. But yeah, that's going on as well. Mm. Um, also, international, uh, not national, international news, but back to national news. Um, former Minister of Justice, David Lametti, mm -hmm. has announced that he is stepping down. Uh, the timing is... I won't say that the timing's interesting, but the timing allows of this announcement because it came soon after the federal court had ruled that some measures in the invocation of the Emergencies Act were unconstitutional and that overall, based on a hindsight test, mm -hmm and not based on the information that the government had at the time at the time it was unjustified well that probably will not hold up but given that the resignation came after that of course the minions are spinning that as right mm -hmm. because oh it was so terrible that he had to resign and now apparently though apparently the whole liberal cabinet has to resign and the government has to resign because they violated the charter and whatnot and it's like um Stephen Harper's G20 order violated the Constitution. Yeah. Uh, Jean Chrétien violated the constitutional rights of Omar Khadr and uh, Maher Arar and all of those when they had them rendered. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no precedent in Canadian law for a government that violates the Canadian the charter rights of Canadians of having or being obligated to step down. No, it's they, happened several times in our lives. Yeah, and it's it's not a thing. 
It's likely to happen again if uh, the Conservatives ever take the seat of power. Prime Minister Stephen Harper is the most overturned Prime Minister in Canadian history by the courts. Mm -hmm. For all his laws. And this guy got overturned by the court. Also in his attempt to reform the Senate. Mm -hmm. And in his process to try and nominate a Supreme Court justice. Remember when he tried to nominate for one of the three positions on the court that are supposed to deal with civil law according to the code in Quebec, which comes from the French tradition in France and not English common law, and that there needs to at least be three of those judges on the Supreme Court in case one of these cases comes to the Supreme Court so it could be adjudicated. He tried to get somebody that had an experience with maritime law instead and say, well, he's from Quebec, so he could fill one of the Quebec positions, but he had no experience in Quebec, the Justinian Code. Mm-hmm. And the Supreme Court said, uh, 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 you can't do that. Every single one of those instances of laws passed by that prime minister that got overturned were him also trying to get away with trampling all over the rights of Canadians. Well... The, the way they go on exactly about neither did he. The way they go on about the, the you got conservatives, well, cons, reformers screaming about, oh, they they paid ten million dollars to that terrorist Omar Qatar. I'm like, yeah, you you know why we paid him that money? That was to get off easy because his charter rights were violated. He was a child at the time, and it would have cost us forty million instead of ten. But they forget to mention that. And well, yes, they never argue the counterfactual. Of course not. Never, never, never. Let's just use the points that, that frame it the way I like. It's not how it works, folks. <laughs> it's not how it works. Um, over the weekend, um, we had something. Uh, unfortunate mm-hmm. is not strong enough a word the word is not coming to mind unfortunately kids um what i don't know what you're talking fredericton what happened of course the weekend um a synagogue had been vandalized i didn't know this yes uh i'm probably going to say this wrong but i'm going to the skuglai israel synagogue in fredericton according to the cbc the broken windows were fixed and the healing had begun by the time people started to gather for a vigil outside the Skuglai Israel Synagogue in downtown Fredericton on Sunday afternoon. People gathered to show their support for the community after the congregation arrived to celebrate Sabbath on Saturday, which was International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Mm-hmm. Only to find the building's front windows shattered. Quote, we got a lot of great words yesterday and a lot of great action today, said Daniel Chippen, who sits on the board of directors at the synagogue. Over 100 people showed up to show their support for the community and a GoFundMe was set up for the synagogue. The vandalism happened, as we mentioned, on International Holocaust Remembrance Day and on the heels of the top court of the United Nations ordering Israel to take measures to prevent and punish direct incitement of genocide in its war in Gaza. People supporting Palestinians and Israelis have clashed at events, but on Sunday, a group from Fredericton Palestine Solidarity attended to show support. Let me say that again for people like Lori Goldstein. Who is still working for the rag that published that anti-Semitic Zelensky cartoon. Mm. I might yeah. add. People supporting Palestinians and Israelis have clashed at events, but on Sunday, a group from Fredericton Palestine, Palestine Solidarity attended to show support. Quote, anti-Semitism has been a problem in North America for as long as there's been a Canada and we hate to see it in our community and we hope to be able to show up for our friends and neighbors when they experience this, said Angus Fletcher, who spoke for the group. This is the spirit of Canada. Mm -hmm. This is the spirit of Canada. Conservatives 
would like to have you believe that all Arabs and all Palestinians and all Muslims are anti-Semites. Well, remember, these, this is the party that did the old uh, snitch line. Yes. And, and tried to make it illegal for uh, women to wear a hijab or a burqa. And, and I have my own thoughts on the hijab or burqa, but if it, it, it's your choice. You yes. start to restrict. You know, here's the problem with that law that Harper tried to bring in. He's he's trying to control women's bodies, yeah. and he and he brought it about saying, "Well, it's because men are making women wear this." I'm like, "Yeah, but if you take away their right to do it, you're doing the same thing." Yes. And we don't actually know that that is the case in every single relationship. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was at uh, citizenship swearing ceremonies they tried to ban wear of the niqab. Again, for people who don't understand civics or don't know the civics of this, by the time you get to the swearing-in ceremony, that's symbolic. Mm -hmm. All the other stuff has been done already. Your citizenship has already been approved. And if you happen to be a woman who's wearing a kneecap, whether it's by choice mm -hmm. or whether... It's because it's been imposed. You actually have to go to a citizenship judge in the privacy of their chambers, mm -hmm. female judge, mm -hmm. and remove it and show your face while you swear. Period. So everybody's identity is known. Everybody's face is seen. The whole purpose of that was to make somebody's First seconds as an official citizen, one of religious superiority, being crushed under the thumb of religious superiority mm -hmm. and bigotry. Because that's the message we want to send people, right? As they're taking their oath in public. For some of them, it's one of the proudest moments of their lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this from the party as well when terrorism was the subject du jour post September 11th for about mm -hmm. a decade every instant possible that they could have associated a Muslim person with terrorism they seized upon oh yeah this runs deep in that party. Um, so yeah, as of Sunday, the Fredericton police did not have an update into their investigation into whether the vandalism was the result of targeted hostility. Certainly do hope, certainly do hope that they catch the people who did that because that type of intimidation is something that we just cannot have. We just cannot have. Also, news from uh, the province of Sask, you scratch my back and I'll ensure I will not sack you, Chawan. It seems that uh, Premier Scott Moe has replaced the entirety of the Saskatchewan Human Rights Commission. Mm hmm interesting how that is huh? yes i'm just going to take away the the arm that can restrict me for what i'm trying to do yes on october 19th 2023 the saskatchewan human rights commission came out against proposed legislation that would force schools to alert parents if youth wanted to be referred to by a different pronoun or name now apparently all of their terms were up one of the people resigned around that time but uh, it seems that all of them have been replaced by people nominated by uh, the Saskatchewan Attorney General and Minister of Justice. And uh, according to a video that's uh, done by a guy online you might know as Steve Boots. Oops, that is not the right link I supported, I sent it to you. Uh, it seems that, um, well, the political donation history of a lot of people. Uh, or certain people at least, that have been nominated to investigate whether or not the government of Saskatchewan has violated people's rights. 
is quite interesting. Mm. So um, I'm going to include the link here for you. Maybe we'll show it on tomorrow's show specifically because we have to wrap up here today. So, kids and cubs, we hope that you enjoyed this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show because we love making this for you. Remember that sharing is caring, word of mouth is priceless, so please tell your peeps and poops all about us. And if you would like not to miss an episode, you don't have to, thanks to the Ray Girl. That squiggly right under my chin is our QR code that brings you to our pod page site. And if you're listening, that's podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver, lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words. And that way, when we have something fresh off the bandwidth, it will come directly to you. And if you would like to support us in other ways, please go to our YouTube page, True North Eager Beaver Media, and lick, I mean like, share, and subscribe. <laughs> oh, you meant lick. I did. Mean lick. I did. I did. <laughs> Just lick my, lick my buttons. <laughs> and that way you will help us out. Make like Kit Elaine. And uh, yes, smash with our buttons. And if you would like to support us in yet other ways, you can go to our coffee page, which is where you will find the tip jar for the Eager Beaver Lodge Emergency Hydration Fund. That QR code by Mr. Grizzly's head right there will take you there. And if you're listening, that's coffee, ko-fi.com slash eager beaver. And we do have a lot of kits to thank, but we will not do it on this episode because we have to go. But I will not forget. Thank you for your generous uh, donations. If you would like to write to us, truenorthegerbeaver at gmail.com. And uh, if you would like to see longer form written stuff from us that is not on our Twitter feed because, you know, 280 characters, our Facebook page, True North Eager Beaver, go there, subscribe there, and uh, we'll have stuff for you. Uh, we always have stuff for you there, longer versions of uh, what it is that we put on our Twitter. All right, from the Beaver Lodge. Oh, because democracy is something that you do. Write those letters. HamiltonHelps.com. Sign that petition. Help uh, Jordan's mom and Kit mm -hmm. Leanne uh, with their endeavors. And uh, do write uh, to your MPs and tell them that uh, you would like them to do something about homelessness because you do not like the policy choice that's being made in our name. All right. Mr. Grizzly, do you have some words of wisdom? Please. Yeah. Yeah, I remember to buy coffee. <laughs> I'm really tired. And when you see racism happening, say something. Call it out. All right, Mr. Grizzly, roll them credits. Okie dokie. You are listening to a True North Eager Bee Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, the Miss Fee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Pepper Master, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph something for our opening and closing sequence music. Um, to, speaking about Jordan's mom, uh, Kit Dan reminds us uh, to stop on, on Wednesday. If you happen, I'm guessing to, that this is in Toronto, to stop at 165 Barton Street and celebrate Jordan's memory. January 31st uh, would, is Jordan's birthday. Forever 26, if I remember correctly, uh, what Kit Angela told us. And, uh, and a little bit of good news before we go. Uh, congratulations to Valerie Grenier, our downhill ski ace. For uh, picking up a bronze medal in the downhill this time on a race, which was really interesting because three people tied for the bronze. So there was actually five people on the podium, wow. which is kind of rare for the first time in a World Cup race. And James Crawford, who took a fifth in the Super G in Garmisch Partenkirchen. Top 10. Good I have an image for you I will share now. Okie dokie. Michael Deatter, oh. uh, Michael Deatter uh, political cartoon from a couple of days ago. Oh my God, yes. Welcome to Canada. It's um, presumably Danielle Smith standing beside 
Tucker Carlson and all his bags coming through lies, sexism, lies, hate, conspiracies, misogyny, racism, lies. They're all mine, he says, as they pass by on the baggage claim wheel. Oh my God, I didn't even talk about him and the Danielle Smith, though. Yeah. Remind me to do that on the following show. And yeah. that uh, address, 165 Barton Street, is not in Toronto. It's in Hamilton. That's what I thought. It's Hamilton. Yeah. All right. Have right. a perfect day. Yeah, we'll see you later, eh? I gotta go. I gotta meet and I gotta go do a thing. I'm a, I'm a busy man. Busy, busy. Busy grizzly.